Uh, thank you first, the organizers, for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak here at this wonderful meeting. So indeed, uh, I'll talk about the phase separation uh, and our inspiration indeed came from biology, from the uh, liquid-liquid-like phase separation. Part of the work uh, has already been published, but today I'll mostly focus on the uh, new work that hasn't been published yet, but I'll also mention what have you already done. Right? So like I said, uh, the inspiration came from the liquid-liquid-like phase separation. So if you look at the classical textbook of the cell, you would see that you have a, a lot of internal organelles. And for many, many years, it was thought that you know, they're physically separated from each other and the environment with the, via physical membranes. But in the last decade or so, it was recognized that, many, that like, there are also many, many membraneless organelles which form via liquid liquid life phase separation. So if you look at this movie inside the nucleus of a frog cell, you know, uh, where like, you know, like you have like certain molecules are fluorescently labeled. When you look at this, it looks like just like oil droplets that are merging together, right? So in some sense, uh, this looks like a classical uh, oil droplets. And, I, and, you know, it's important to mention that all of these membranous organelles, they are also important for functions of the cell, right? But, uh, you know, so like I said, this looks like an ordinary fluid. But if I would zoom in on this, you would see that each of these fluids is actually very complex, right? So this is just a, some schematic, it's just a, some simulation of bacterial cytoplasm, just to convey the idea. So you know, inside the so cells are extremely crowded. You have lots of different molecules and proteins, and they're all jiggling around, right? So it's not a priori clear uh, how you can find you uh, these interactions between many of these molecules in order to phase separate in some hierarchical structures which are important for biological uh, uh, functions and so on. And you know, even if we forget about the activity that uh, Jenny just mentioned, which you know, probably plays some role uh, in these uh, phase separated systems, if you just think about the classical thermodynamics, that you know, like if you have like many, many different components, according to the Gibbs phase rule, you could have as many coexisting phases. Right? But yet, we normally see like a small number of coexisting phases, right? Uh, and also, even though people think that uh, the passive thermodynamic forces are like one of the important drivers of this phase separation, it's also a good question, what does the activity do inside cells? Uh, right? Uh, and, you know, people think that one of the important things that the activity does is because these are such a crowded phases that maybe activity helps fluidize uh, these phases to prevent them from gel, which would be harmful for cells, right? So inspired by these, you know, like we asked ourselves, you know, like the following question. So let's say that you give me a liquid mixture of, with different types of molecules marked with different symbols, uh, and you tell me what is the concentration of each molecule, how they interact with each other. We would like to come, uh, come up with tools that will tell us, you know, like how many different phases will form what will be the composition of different phases? For example, the blue phase may have more star molecules and the red phase may have more circle molecules. And also, we would like to know how they will arrange in space, right? Uh, I will mostly focus on the second part. I'll briefly mention the first part, you know, how can we predict the number of phases and their compositions? But, uh, and this was published, and the, for the most part, I'll focus on their morphology and also how we can reverse engineer interactions between molecules. If you tell me what sort of structure you would like to have, how should I you know, design my system and what should be intermolecular interactions so that I would really get uh, this structure, right? And I will assume that we're using just classical thermodynamics. Everything will be uh, you know, passive equilibrium forces. There will be no activity. OK. So uh, here, for the examples that I will show, we're going to use the Flory Huggins mixture, Flory Huggins regular solution. Where uh, so the free energy density per, uh, normalized by KBT has two parts. One is the mixing entropy, and one is the interaction energy between molecules. So Ci will be volume fractions of different molecules, where I will go from one to n for the n different number of phases, and we're going to assume that the system is incompressible. So the sum of all the volume fractions will be equal to one. Uh, and then the relative role between the entropy interactions will be. Uh, um, will be uh, characterized by this chi ij matrix, which characterizes the interactions between uh, components i and j, right? And for the binary systems, we know very well from classical thermodynamics courses that if you write the free energy as a function of concentration of one of the molecules, if the free energy is in non-convex, 
then actually there will be a region where you get phase separation and you can identify that region by using the maximum common tangent construction and the two tangent points will be the concentrations of the two uh, phases, A uh, and B. And if you happen to have an average concentration C0, which lies between these two phases, uh, then this would be the free energy of the mixed state but you can lower that free energy to this value if, you phase up, if the system phase separates into one region with that concentration and another region with that concentration. Outside of that region, uh, the, the, the energy is con uh, convex and then the mixture is uh, still like thermodynamically stable, right? So once you generalize this from two to uh, more than uh, two components, then in principle, the free energy will be a free energy surface in a highly dimensional space you can still use Maxwell uh, 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 construction idea because now you have to look for common tangent hyperplanes and then the attachment points will be the concentration of phases and the number of the attachment points will be the number of coexisting phases, right? So in principle that works, but you know, numerically that's actually very hard to do. Uh, but now I will tell you um, how we can actually uh, use uh, a trick to actually do this for us. And the first thing you should notice is that once you do this common tangent construction, then basically if you look, then basically what you have, what you have replaced the non-convex part of the free energy with a convexified, right? So if I look at this outer part plus this red part plus this outer part, uh, we have basically constructed the convex hull of the free energy, right? And basically if we now construct a convex hull of the free energy surface in a highly dimensional space, I will tell you how we can read information from the convex hull to get the information that we want. And this is uh, what we published uh, previously in the soft matter paper, and we were inspired by this PRL paper by uh, Fabrice uh, Talmans and Carlos Marquez's group in France, where they designed this algorithm for ternary mixtures and we generalized it to more than three. And the idea is the following. For ternary mixtures, you have this ternary plot where this is the whole phase space. This would be pure component one, pure component two, pure component three, and every other dot is some uniform uh, mixture. You calculate the free energy at every this discrete point. You run a convex hull algorithm. So now you have a convexified free energy. And when you project it back on this ternary plot, you see that these some triangles are still small, but some triangles smirched and they got stretched. And basically they figure out how to read off this information to construct phase diagram. Basically, the small triangles are the one where the uniform mixture is stable, but the one that got stretched, that's where you can have two or three coexisting phases. And basically, the ends of these uh, uh, triangles tell you the com compositions of the phases. So if you have a concentration here, it's going to phase separate into this phase and that phase, uh, and that will be the two coexisting phases. And if you have a concentration here, it's going to phase separate into one, two, and three phases with these three concentrations. And we generalize this algorithm uh, so that it can run, uh, uh, so that we can also uh, use it uh, to, uh, for systems with more than three components, right? Uh, so, but, so this will tell me that if I tell you like what are in the interaction parameters uh, chi ij and what are the concentrations, I will tell you how many phases will form. And then you can say, oh, if, if the cell is changing concentration of some molecules, maybe it's shifting uh, around this phase diagram, it can change from certain number of phases to a different number of phases, right? So, and so far, we can predict uh, how many different phases will form and also their compositions. But because this is bulk thermodynamics, we cannot say anything about how they will arrange in space, right? And this will be the focus of the second part of the, my talk, uh, which is new and unpublished yet. Okay, so now uh, what we will do is now, if I actually want to figure out how they will arrange in space, then I also need to take into account the interfacial energy between different uh, pairs of phases, right? And in the Flory Huggins uh, uh, model, we have to add these gradient terms, uh, which will take into account of the interfacial energy. So here we assume, here you have the same chi ij interactions as here. Lambda is characteristic uh, width of the interface. And here we assume that the molecules are small and they have a short range interactions. That's why you have the same chi ij here. If you were de dealing with polymer blends, then this would look slightly different. But, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. I, 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 I will just present some concepts uh, which don't really care about this form of the free energy. And then we're just going to evolve this system in time. So this is just a model B dynamics because we're going to assume that the number of molecules is fixed. So this is the chemical potential. Gradient of the chemical potential will drive flow. Uh, mobility parameters will basically recover uh, 
This is like just a complicated way of writing a diffusion equation, and then divergence of the flow will tell you how concentration locally changes in time. In principle, there's also a random uh, like thermal noise here, but we'll neglect this and we'll only focus on spinel decomposition, right? And if I run this for a few different um, uh, you know, systems uh, with different concentrations and interactions, we're gonna get like you know quite different uh, morphologies. Right, of, uh, uh, we get the usual oscillate ripening where these structures, they coarsen over time and then the small droplets will disappear. And now we would like to know what determines these morphologies. Of course, what's important are surface tensions. So if you have three phases, alpha, beta, gamma, with three surface tensions, the surface tensions will determine topology. So if every surface tension is smaller than some of the other two, then these triple junctions are mechanically stable because you can think that you, you can have a force balance between these three forces. But if one of the surface tensions dominates, and then uh, so it's larger than some of the other two, then the other two forces will never be able to balance that one. So if the three of them find together, these alpha beta surface tensions will pull them away and gamma will come in between in order to try to get rid of this unwet large uh, surface energy, right? And once we know the compositions of our phases, and we know uh, how they interact, we can use the kant hillard formalism to estimate surface tensions, right? So now if you know uh, our surface tensions, we can just look at these inequalities and we can tell you locally whether it should look like this or it should look like that. Uh, and uh, what will be interesting is will be, uh, once we go beyond three phases, it will be useful to think about this topology in terms of graphs where each uh, node corresponds to a phase, and if they share an interface, we're gonna make a link. So here all phases are in contact, so we have fully connected graph. Here alpha and beta are not touching each other, so we have one uh, link missing. Okay, so surface tensions will determine topology, but of course volume fractions are also important. On both left and right, we have the same three phases. I just tuned the volume fractions so that on the left, we have like a small volume fraction of red and green. That's why we get droplets. But on the right, I increase the volume fraction of green so you have like this uh, extended uh, structure, right? So, so volume fractions will determine the detailed geometry and surface tensions will determine topology. Okay, so now how do we go beyond three, right? So if we go to four, then I can make six topologically different graphs, and I'll tell you that they correspond to topologically different morphologies, and I'll tell you how we can, uh, gener uh, how we can construct these structures. The idea is the following. You take a graph, and you construct subgraphs of triplets. So if I take a fully connected graph, subgraphs are also uh, fully connected. For each of these subgraphs, I know how to write inequalities for surface tensions. Now I have a system of inequalities we can solve with the standard linear programming uh, problem. Of course, these are inequalities for surface tensions. In my model, I have to put interaction parameters, which are not surface tensions. So we still have, in general, non-trivial inverse problem. Uh, but in a limit, when the chi ij interactions are large, then the separated phases are almost pure in one component. And in that regime, the surface tensions are approximately proportional to the interaction parameters. So in that regime, I can replace these gammas with chi's and we can solve uh, the system of inequalities. And here is an example where this would be 2D, 3D simulation, and here we have equal volume fractions of red, green, white, and blue. Uh, so here the average concentration is marked uh, here where you have these uh, different colors. And uh, so here if we have equal volume of all of them, you get the usual 120 degree angles because the surface tensions are the same. And if we increase the volume fraction of white, then this will drop, uh, uh, these triplets will color triplets will break into small droplets, both in 2D and 3D. Okay, so now let's play this game and, and see what happens for other graphs, uh, right? So now if I remove this link between uh, green and white, this means that green hates white. Now when we break this into subgraphs, now we remove this link. So now I have a different subgraph, but again, I know how to write inequalities for surface tensions. We solve them and here they are. So here for the equal volume fractions, you see that white and green don't really touch each other. Transiently they can touch, but eventually they will get pushed away, right? So you see that uh, indeed uh, what we expect in terms of topology is obeyed. Uh, and if you increase the volume fraction of white, then green has to hide inside these red and uh, blue droplets, both in 2D and 3D. And if you increase the volume fraction of some other phase, let's say blue, then this will break into droplets where now red, uh, into droplets where red has to shield green and white from each other and the same thing happens in 3D and here the blue is transparent so they can actually see this structure. 
And now we can just proceed in that same fashion, right? So if I remove one more link, now here in this graph, red wants to shield white from green and blue, right? So white never touches green and blue. And now if you look at the subgraphs, now you see that if you look at the triplets of white, green, and blue, you see that there is only one link uh, and the other two are missing, right? So I don't really know whether I should write inequalities for this case or that case. But you know, if you actually give me three real fluids, then I will have some, I will know the surface tension so I, I know which uh, inequalities there will be. Uh, uh, so basically, this will tell you that uh, there are multiple ways of achieving the same final topology, because I can assume either that case or that case. Transient uh, dynamics will be different, uh, because here the white, green, and blue are happily sitting together, but then the red will push them apart. And here the blue will go in between green and white, and then the red one will push them apart. So the final state will be the same, but transits will be different, right? And here are the cases where you see indeed see that white is hiding inside red and never sees green and blue. If you increase the volume of white, then you, know, you have like these green and blue droplets that are coated with red in 2D and 3D. If you increase the volume of blue, then you get like these uh, red uh, ears with like uh, white inside and so on. Right, so again, by tuning the volume fractions, you can get drastically different geometries, but the topology is the same because it only depends on surface tensions. Okay, uh, and, and yeah, and if I would assume, uh, anyway, so if I would assume different, so case 3A and 3B will give you the same structures regardless of what I assumed for these surface tensions. So there are multiple ways of getting the same structure. Uh, this one will be interesting, so here is a diamond graph where all the subgraphs, where the triple junctions are unstable. And if I play this movie with equal volume fractions, notice that you get these quadruple junctions both in 2D and 3D, they're stable. This is not what you would expect. Normally, you get like stable triple junctions, but not quadruple junctions. And of course, if you increase the volume fraction of white, then you're going to get uh, these green droplets. Uh, they're coated with red and blue because they have to hide from white. And we can uh, understand why these quadruple junctions are stable, because basically for this case, if you try to break them apart, you're going to create a new interface, either this interface or that. But for that specific graph, these inequalities between surface tensions are such that these new surface tensions that are formed, they overpower these two and these two, and they will physically bring these points back together. And the same thing goes here. So if you try to perturb the quadruple junctions, you will see that they're mechanically stable. OK, so there are two more graphs, right? So if I use uh, this graph where the white is in touch with all of them, but none of them are in contact with each other, so now white basically acts as a shielding phase that kind of uh, separates and shields these other three phases from each other. And if you increase the volume of blue, uh, then you will see that the white that's shielding green and uh, red from each other is going to uh, coat them and is also going to protect them from the blue outside. Uh, OK. Uh, so I'm almost done, uh, right? So there is one more graph that I showed you uh, that I haven't shown you yet. So this is a line graph, and it's this line graph that leads to these hierarchical structures when you have a lot of uh, white. Of course, if you have equal volume fractions, then you don't really know what is inside, what is outside, so you can get like very complicated uh, structures. But topologically, that's the same as a hierarchical structure, which is what I showed you in biological system at the beginning. Okay, so. Now, we have a, with these graphs, we have a way of classifying all topologically different uh, prescriptions. And I also showed you a little bit of a procedure uh, how we can reverse engineer surface uh, energies in order to get these different structures. Of course, now we can go further and say, you know, you know, let's, you know, I can give you a structure, and I want to reverse engineer parameters that will give me that structure. So let's say that I want to get hierarchical, hierarchical structure like this where I have one droplet inside another, inside another, and so on, which is often what happens in biological system. So the first step is we create equivalent graph. And once I have a graph, I write inequalities between surface tensions. We solve these inequalities. And here is an example of uh, uh, these like hierarchical structures with four phases, when the one phase is transparent and the one with one, uh, five phases. Right? And as usual, you get like this uh, Oswald ripening. Right, so we can go further. Again, uh, here is going to be an example. We're going to have a gray is going to be a shielding phase that's going to shield the other four phases from each other. Again, we write a graph. We write inequalities. We solve them. And here on the left and right, 
uh, uh, sorry, on the left and the right, we both have topologically the same graph. On the left, we have like a large volume of the shielding phase, so you get like these droplets of four phases that are separated from each other and they coarsen over time, whereas on the right, uh, we have uh, a lot of phase four and we reduce the volume of the shielding phase, which is gonna encapsulate the green, blue, and red uh, droplets that are gonna be protected from each other but also protected from the outside, right? So now in that way, uh, we can use this idea based on graphs to kind of reverse engineer parameters to get these structures. So with this, uh, let me end and let me acknowledge people who did the work. Uh, this was done in collaboration with my colleague Miko Hataya at Princeton. Sheng Mao is my postdoc uh, who developed this convex hole algorithm and developed a code uh, that produced all these movies. And Milena uh, is an undergrad at Princeton that actually came up with this idea of classifying topologies based on graphs. And the other undergrads uh, were also involved with this project. And let me just mention that uh, two summers from now, I'm organizing a KTP workshop in Santa Barbara on the physics of elastic films. This is gonna happen between May and July. Uh, you, so you, and uh, the deadline for applications is coming up. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to tell you uh, more about it. Thank you. Hello, thanks for uh, this talk. Um, I have a question. So the, <clears throat> it looks like these, at least in your dynamical algorithm, these phases, they course and then course and then course and become bigger and bigger and bigger. So, so at some point there must be a mechanism to select the size in the biological system. And I'm wondering whether this mechanism might actually interfere with the morphologies that you find here. Okay, very good. Uh, so often, you know, so here we only considered liquid mixtures and indeed, here they would coarsen indefinitely and you would just have like giant blobs, right? In biological system, this is happening inside the cytoskeleton or inside the chromatin. So, so then you also have mechanical interactions with the environment. And there were like experiments by Eric Dufresne where he was looking at the phase separation inside an elastic gels. And he, he figured out that because of the strain stiffening of these networks, uh, then the, this can effectively arrest and select a final size of these droplets. So that would be one way of achieving that, but there could also be other ways, like pickering um, emulsions and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I have two questions. One is, uh, is the surface tension in, in this specific model based only on the gradients of concentration, or yeah. could it be affected by some other? It could be affected by other things. Of course, we're just doing a gradient expansion, so we're just looking at the leading order terms. So this is so-called like phase field models where you assume diffuse interface, mm -hmm. uh, right? Um, where you will get like all the physics right, but uh, of course you can just expand to higher, higher order terms. It won't change the qualitative picture. I see. So, so in short, if, if there are other terms, you can still lump them into yeah. the gradient concentration. Yes. So conversely, if you had a measurement of surface fluctuations, yeah. um, could you from that estimate gradient concentrations? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So, so if I know what the surface tensions are, then, then I can, from surface tensions, immediately figure out what the morphology would be. Yeah. There was a question there. there Mahana, yeah. Is there a question? So, uh, can you, people hear me? Uh, you can hear me, I'm sure. So, I have a question about what would happen if I have a very large number of components, which is what you started with, and your flory Huggins parameters weren't deterministic, or, or you didn't have mm -hmm. uh, enough information, but you started thinking about the whole thing from a probabilistic perspective. Yes. So and similarly with the surface tensions, which are essentially right. penalties associated right. with the interface. What would happen in the limit of very large right. I and J? So Dan Frankel and Will Jacobs have thought about that. So they assume that these chi IJs were drawn from some Gaussian distribution yeah. with, a, uh, with a mean and a variance. And in, indeed, they saw that in a very, very large, in a limit of large number of components, uh, indeed, you get transition between either a mixture, if a mixture wins, or when the interactions win, then you can get like multiple components. And what you also see that when you go to, uh, to large and larger number of concentration, uh, uh, number of molecules, well, then you see that this threshold when transition from entropy dominated to separated regime becomes harder and harder. So you have more and more types of molecules they have to more and more hate each other. So chi have to be larger and larger in order to really achieve phase separation. 
And of course, there are physical limits of how strongly they can hate each other. Uh, so as a result, that's why we think you get like fewer, fewer numbers, even though you have like a, a lot of uh, different components. Does that say anything about what actually is happening in the biological system, either from the point of view of evolvability if one can have Yeah. Uh, so of course, uh, in real chemistry, like you know, like the num the kinds of different type, like you know, even though you have like a lot of different species, some of them are chemically similar to each other, right? So maybe like you have effectively fewer number of different components, right? Uh, of course, we are now toying with the idea that maybe with these DNA strands, maybe we can try to engineer some of these systems where you could really probe lots of different phases, but we're still exploring that. Okay, let's thank the speaker again to stay on schedule.